Welcome back. So our uh, final exam is Tuesday, a week from today, 8 a.m. in this very room in person, and, and I will expect everybody to be here, except for one fine gentleman who has, uh, you know, been, been home all semester, but everybody else should be present in the room at 8 a.m. Um, we are, uh, you know, done with the new material. So today I just wanted to talk about the final exam. You know, we can go over any topics you like. I handed out this review sheet and I sent it in an email this morning to the folks at home, or to everybody. Uh, so hopefully you all got it. Um, what you see on the review sheet is actually just our, our previous two review sheets, uh, just the same problems stuck in there again. And then followed by, you can see... By the time you get to like the, I guess the fourth page is um, section 11.6, new stuff. So it says the new stuff will be at least one third of the exam. The exam is scheduled for three hours. I'm not gonna try to make it, you know, super long. Um, you should expect it to be, I guess, a, a bit longer than our two in-class tests were, but not twice as long, even though you will have twice as much time to do it. Um, you can have the whole three hours, although you don't, uh, like I said, I'm not going to try and make you uh, take three hours to do it. Um, yeah, the new stuff is starting with 11.6, which is the ratio and the root test. Uh, you may notice that I skipped, there is no section 11.7 on the sheet. That's because that in the book is just kind of like a review section of all the different convergence tests. Um, it's not really its own topic, though. All right, so for, as for the new stuff, we have the ratio test, the root test. Um, the ratio test we did many times. We only did a few examples of the root test, so you might want to refresh your memory on that. Then we talked about power series in general, then um, finding the power series of a function, and then the Taylor series, which is another uh, sort of fancy way of finding the uh, power series of a function. All right, on the next page of the, uh, of the sheet there, you will see... Um, things that you have to memorize, uh, simple derivatives and antiderivatives of polynomials, logarithms, and sine and cosine, I put on there. Also, the definition of cinch and cosh, which sometimes comes up, and the derivatives of those. The derivative of cinch is cosh, and the derivative of cosh is cinch. So, not, not too taxing, I don't think. Then we have the integration by parts formula that you should know. And then um, the convergence, the various things about convergences. So for, um, you should know what the P-series is. The P-series is this, right? And this converges when uh, P is greater than 1, and it diverges otherwise. So this is, the, this is one of the standard series. And then also the geometric series, that's this one, uh, the sum of... Um, powers uh, of, sorry, it's nth powers, something like this. I'm trying to remember that it's R that we usually use, right? It's like that. The geometric series is when the n is inside the exponent. And this converges when the absolute value of R is less than 1, right? Um... Yeah, that's what I mean by you should memorize. I mean, I don't know if those are formulas, but you should you should know that. And then also the convergence tests and how to use them. Not exactly formulas to memorize, but um, strategies or something. All right, and then you will see on the paper a uh, big list of formulas that I will give you. And I'm going to give them to you just like this. I'm not going to try to tell you what they are. But the first two there, the first one is the um, volume of revolution using the washers method. Hope you remember that. And then the second one there is the volume of revolution using the cylindrical shells. And then we just have a bunch of derivatives, the integral, and then some random facts about sine squared and cosine squared, which are useful in the trigonometric integrals section. All right, and then I, I put a bunch of answers for all the questions. Um, anybody got any basic questions about like what will be on the test, what will not be on the test? Yeah, basically everything. So it's an easy answer. 
All right, so what shall we talk about? I would be happy to go over any of these old things or new things. There's kind of a lot of uh, different topics, in my opinion. Sure, volumes with washers. So there's some on the paper here. Maybe I, I brought my book just so that those types of problems especially can be kind of tricky for, for me to invent on the fly because the numbers get all crazy. So let's try. All right, how about this? I'm just taking this problem out of the book. Find the volume given by uh, rotating etc. So this one, you doing all right in there? Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm doing number eight in section 5.2. I don't know if anybody cares. This is in the, um, in the newer edition of the book. Uh, by the way, sorry, I meant to uh, mention, I did post the homework assignment. I, I didn't do it until Sunday or maybe yesterday. Uh, it's going to be due on the day of the final exam. Uh, so um, check it out. It's just about the last, uh, the last stuff, the Taylor series. Um, okay, it's... Yes, I haven't done that yet. You're ready, right? It's all right. Okay, so I got y equals 6 minus x squared. So it says, you know, the, the region bounded by this and y equals 2. And I'm supposed to be rotating, rotating about the x-axis. All right, and I want to find the volume of that thing. So 6 minus x squared, first of all, this looks like a parabola going down because it's a minus x squared. And it goes through the y-axis at 6. It looks like this. And it says the region, so this here is 6. This one's a little tricky to even figure out what the picture looks like. I think they probably intend for you to use like a graphing calculator to decide what the picture looks like. Uh, so this this aspect of the problem, maybe I would try to help you out. Maybe I would give you the picture, just so that you can tell what the what the scenario looks like. And y equals two, since that's six up there, y equals two is down here, right? And so the region we're talking about is this uh, oops, this stuff, right? Bounded between the curve and y equals two. And then you're supposed to rotate this around the x-axis. So it sort of goes this way, right? And we have this other thing down here. All right. This is the shape that I want. And we're going to use the formula that I'm going to give you on the test. It says the volume is integral a to b pi times the outer radius squared minus the inner radius squared dx, all right? In this problem, the formula, you know, sometimes it's a little tricky to find the formula for the outer and the inner radius, although it's not so difficult in this one, I don't think. Uh, a typical, it might be helpful to draw sort of a, a typical cut here. One of these washers, its inner radius is this distance and its outer radius is this distance up here. Sorry, my picture is a little crowded, but this is the inner radius, right? And then the outer radius would be this big one. What do you think? Anybody want to tell me either one or the other of those? The inner radius or the outer radius? Uh, I don't think the outer radius is 6. Like, it, it goes up to 6 here, so actually... I don't think so. One one of these, if I look at... 
Yeah, I think the outer radius being this this height here is just the distance from the x-axis to up to the curve, wherever it, it happens to be. All right. This washer that I've drawn here, I know my picture is, is pretty crowded. The shape is like this, right? Um, whoa, that's not what I meant. And when you make one of these cuts, it looks like this. What? Sorry. And it has this inside radius and this outside radius, which goes all the way up to the top. Now it doesn't go, the very top of this thing is at six, but the outer radius is just going from the x-axis up to the whatever particular point you're looking at. And that is given by the value of the function. This is just the y value of the function, which is um, six minus x squared. So that's what the, uh, that's what the outer radius is, six minus x squared. What about the inner radius? Yeah, the inner radius is always 2. As you move back and forth, this x value across the figure, the inner radius, that smaller one there, is always 2. Okay? What about the A and the B? Actually, in this problem, the A and the B are kind of tricky. Uh, it's not... Um, that's usually not the case, but... Uh, the A and the B would be these, these two x values, right? Here and here. Or this one would be the A, right? And this is the B. They are determined, they are the X values where this curve intersects that line, right? These two sort of yellow points that I'm marking there. The, that's going to be the X values of those points are what the A and the B are. How could we figure those values out? Well, they are intersections of two different curves, the curve with the line. So I'm going to set those two equations equal to each other and solve for x. This is a little tricky also. I think in a problem like this, I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to make every little piece of it complicated. Um, anyway, to find those two values, I'm going to set the two things equal to one another. I have y equals 6 minus x squared. I also have y equals 2. So set those equal to each other. Uh, at least the number is going to work out nicely. I get 2 equals 6 minus x squared, which means x squared equals 4. So these numbers are plus 2 and minus 2, right? Take the square roots. x equals plus 2 and minus 2. That's the A and the B. All right. So in conclusion, it's not a conclusion. I'm just finishing the setup, right? A and B are minus 2 and 2. Then we get pi. Then we get the outer radius squared, which is 6 minus x squared squared minus the inner radius squared, which is 2 squared, like that. And now the setup is complete. Any questions about that so far? Now we just got to do the integral, which if you, hopefully is not so hard to do. In this case, how do we do the integral? I think you better like do the foil on that first part, the squaring, and then combine it with the, uh, the 2. Maybe I'll pull the pi out, because that isn't going to have much of an effect on anything. And then do the FOIL right there. 6 minus x squared, the whole thing squared, gives me a 36 for the constant part. On the inside, we get 6x squared. And then on the outside, we get another 6x squared. So it's minus 12x squared. And then at the end, plus x to the 4. And then I have a minus 4. And the 36 and the 4 can add together. Gives me 32. So pi... Integral minus 2 to 2, 32 minus 12x squared, eh, plus x to the 4. And now we can just do the integral and plug everything in. So we do the integral, antiderivative, 32x minus uh, 12x squared becomes 12 over 3x cubed, and then plus 1 fifth x to the 5 for minus 2 to 2. And plug them in. 32 times 2 minus 12 over 3 times x cubed plus 1 fifth. Sorry, I'm plugging in 2 here, so not x cubed. 2, whoa. 2 cubed plus 1 fifth times 2 to the fifth minus. I mean that. 
Same spot, same stuff, but with minus 2. 32 minus 2. Minus 12 over 3. Negative 2 cubed plus 1 fifth, negative 2 to the 5. There you go. This is my final answer. One more of those. All right. That one, I think, is, I mean, maybe a little hard, although the finding the functions for the inner and outer radius was easy. All the other parts of it were kind of, kind of hard. So that strikes me as being, I would say that one was like on the edge of being too hard for the test. You know, on the test, like if this were a test just on this stuff, I don't think this one would be too hard. But just because the final exam is trying to cover everything, on, uh, especially on old material like this, I'm not going to try to intentionally give you a really hard one that, uh, that you may have forgotten how to do. Do you want to try one with the shells? Yeah, why not? Let's try one with the shells. Um, I would be tempted to try just do the same one with shells, but this one is, is a real pain to do with the shells because it's being rotated around the x-axis. You have to re... You have to sort of turn the thing sideways, do it in terms of uh, x instead of y. I don't really want to do that. So I'm going to try and find a nicer one. Shells to find the volume. I don't like these ones. All right, this one maybe. Okay, let's try. This is section 5.3, number 17, in case you care. Uh, y equals 4x minus x squared, and y equals 3. So this is the region that you're considering, and I want to rotate around x equal 1. Let's see. I don't know if I like this one, but we'll do it. 4x minus x squared. So that's a parabola going down also with x-intercepts of um, 0 and 4, I believe. So it looks like this. Okay, the region bounded by that and y equals 3. All right, so y equals 3. I don't know exactly where that is. It's, it's somewhere like there, I guess. I, I think it's below the, the top of that parabola. It must be, or else this, the shape would look too crazy. And then rotating around x equal 1. Okay, so apparently I bet that intersection is to the right of x equal 1, or maybe right at. We should find out where the, where the straight line intersects the parabola, and I'm going to do that by setting the two things equal to each other. Again, on the test, I, I wouldn't make you do this. I would probably just show you the picture. But let's uh, write this. So this is a quadratic we're going to have to solve for x. Uh, to do that, I'm going to put everything on one side and factor. So it's going to say x squared minus 4x plus 3 equals 0. And then this factors as, sorry. Oh, come on, man. x minus 1, x minus 3, right? So x equal 1 and x equal 3 are the intersection points. So I'm going to revise my picture here a little bit. Uh, my eraser is giant. I don't know why. Sorry. So actually, it looks like this goes all the way over to 4, and the line intersects from 1 to 3. So the parabola goes like this. Right? And this is the uh, region. If you're using a graphing calculator, it's you, you can do all of that instantly. All right, 
Uh, on If this problem was on the test, I would draw the picture for you so that you don't have to work through all of those details. Anyway, we are trying to rotate this around the line x equal 1, which is here, right? So the picture that I get has sort of another one of these lumps, and it rotates around this way. There you go. Okay, all of that, let's see if we can actually set this up. So that's the picture. My formula for the volume is integral uh, from A to B, 2 pi x f of x dx, where f of x is the height at some x. So this picture looks like this. where this is 1, it's 1 to 3 here, like that, right? This is where the picture goes. Okay, so, um, and I suppose it goes back here to 0. This is really at minus 1. My scale is not very, very centered up. But, all right. Let's talk about the A to the B. Where do the A and B go? Anybody remember how to do this? Your choices are minus 1 to 3, or is it just 1 to 3? Yeah, it's just 1 to 3. Remember, the concept of the shell method is you're looking at things that look like this that then get rotated around to here. So each shell looks like one of these, right? And you only go out, so your x values really only go this far, right? From x equal 1 to x equal 3. The shell exists sort of on both ends, but you don't integrate all the way across because the x represents the radius of this shell. So um, the a and the b are 1 and 3. All right. a is 1, b is 3. Okay, uh, what about f of x? That's just the height uh, of the shell. So, yeah, it involves the function, right? The distance from the x-axis all the way up to here, that would be for x minus x squared. That's actually not really the height of the shell, though. The shell itself is, is shorter than that, right? Because the shell itself is only, only this, this high. It's that smaller little bit here. Can anybody say what, what's the height of the shell? It, it does involve that 4x minus x squared. Yeah, it's that much minus 3, because the distance from the uh, axis to the bottom of the figure is 3. And so the difference there is the height of the shell. So in this example, f of x is 4x minus x squared minus 3. And that's that. Let's do it. So the volume will be, I'll take the 2 pi out. Integral a to b is 1 to 3 x times f of x, so it's x times 4x minus x squared minus 3. And now we just do this integral. It's not a hard integral. We distribute the x, and then it's a polynomial. So 2 pi, integral 1 to 3, and then 4x squared minus x cubed minus 3x. Do the antiderivative. I get... 4 third x cubed minus 1 fourth x to the 4 minus 3 halves x squared. Plugging in 1 and 3. I think I did that right. And then I plug them in. 4 thirds times 3 cubed minus 1 fourth times 3 to the 4 minus 3 halves times 3 squared minus. 4 thirds times 1 cubed minus 1 fourth times 1 to the 4 minus 3 halves times 1 squared. That's that. All right. I hope that made sense. These are, uh, these are kind of tricky. Worth refreshing your memory about, in my opinion.
What else we got? Any folks at home want to talk about anything in particular? Okay, so uh, I'm just looking at the paper here. Things like finding the values of certain inverse trig functions, it just you just have to remember what it means. So if I say something like what is um, inverse cosine of <coughs> 1 over root 2, what that means, remember, is I'm asking you what is the angle whose cosine equals 1 over root 2. So what it means is cosine of theta equals 1 over root 2, and your job is to find this. Find it. Cosine is 1 over root 2. Um, 1 over 2 is, uh, that's what you get when you're looking at the 45, 45, 90 triangle, right? Where the sides I would label as 1, 1, and root 2. And so what is the angle whose cosine gives you that as the answer, 1 over root 2? What do you think? Yeah, it's 45 degrees or pi over 4 in radians, of course. So, like, it's this angle here where the adjacent divided by the hypotenuse would be, you know, 1 over root 2, right? This angle is the theta that we're looking for pi over 4 radians. So that means the inverse cosine of 1 over root 2 is pi over 4. 45 degrees, yeah, if you want to say it that way. Although really, you should use radians. I mean, you can say the answer for this in degrees, although if you're using degrees, it using degrees, this much would be fine, but a lot of the formulas about derivatives and integrals don't work using degrees, which is, in one sense, it's just a choice of units and it doesn't matter for that reason, but actually, you know, this fact, for instance, this fact is only true if you're using radians, and like the Taylor series for sine of x, that's only true if you're using radians, so radians are, um, better. But I'm not going to care that much on the on the uh, on the test. You can say uh, degrees if you want. Okay, uh, the next one here is about find the derivative of something or other. So maybe I'll try something like what's the derivative of um, e to the power inverse cosine of x. So to do this, it's going to be a chain rule. I have something on the outside with some weird thing stuck inside of it. And in this case, the outside thing is the e part, and the inside thing is the inverse cosine of x. Um, so to do the chain rule means you do the derivative first on the outside part, which is the e thing. And I hope you all remember the derivative. What's the derivative of e to some power? It is the same thing again, right? The derivative of e to the x is e to the x. So here... That's true if you if you have a constant up there. It is k e to the kx. The integral is one over k e to the kx. Uh, but this I'm not going to use that here because this is when k is a constant, constant multiple of x, which is not what we're talking about in this example. Uh, anyway, doing the derivative of the outer part, which is the e part, I just get the same thing again. So my answer begins like that, and then I have to do, because of the chain rule, I go times, I'll just write the derivative of the inside part, which is inverse cosine of x, right? And so 
my final answer will be actually doing the derivative of that thing. And this is one of the formulas that I give you, I hope, because I don't remember that. Yes, I see it on the paper. Minus 1 over square root 1 minus x squared. That's the derivative of the inverse cosine. This is times negative that thing. And that's how we do it. Uh, what else? From that section, I also saw something about an integral. Okay, so yeah, this one, you can use those derivative formulas also as um, to do integrals. So I could also ask you to do something like, what's the integral of 1 over... Um, <clears throat> How about, sorry, I'm trying to cook this up so that the answers work out nicely. How about that? Integral from 1 to root 3 over 2. Sorry, that's hard to read. Integral from 1 to root 3 over 2 is the upper value there. 1 over 1 minus x squared dx. So when you see that, I mean, you might think of doing a trig substitution here, which you could. Actually, it would work if you did the trig substitution here. Although, this is just, if you look on the uh, list of formulas there, you can see that thing inside the integral is the derivative of the inverse sine, right? And so that means the antiderivative of that is inverse sine of x. So this You can immediately do that, all right? The derivative of inverse sine is 1 over square root 1 minus x squared, and so the antiderivative of that 1 over square root 1 minus x squared is inverse sine of x. Like I said, you could also do a trig substitution here, and it would work. You'd end up with the same stuff. Um, anyway, to, uh, to complete this, we plug the values in, all right? A problem like this, I would probably specifically say, simplify all the inverse trig functions in your answer. Now we have to determine what is the inverse sine of each of those two things, root 3 over 2 or uh, and 1. Um, I don't know. To me, maybe this is a little easier. Anybody know what's the inverse sine of 1? That means what's the angle so that when you... I take the sine of that angle, you get 1 as the answer. For that, I like to remember my graph of sine of x. We're looking for this, right? What's, uh, what's the angle where when you take the sine, you get 1? What do you think? It is pi over 2. Yeah. This, uh, the graph of sine has a pi here and a 2 pi here. So this guy is pi over 2. So this one is pi over 2. What about the first one? Sine, inverse sine of root 3 over 2. When I see the root 3 and the 2, that reminds me of this triangle, the 30, 60, 90 triangle, where this is a 2, this is a 1, and this is a root 3. And actually, I drew it sort of the, the right way around so that the sine of this angle is root 3 over 2. And this is 60 degrees, also known as pi over 3. So pi over 3 is the angle whose sine is root 3 over 2. So this one is pi over 3. So the answer is pi over 3 minus pi over 2. Negative, negative pi over 6, whatever. I'll leave it at that. What else? Anybody else have something they want to talk about? I don't want to do only her. I value everyone's interests. Some people didn't do so hot on that quiz we just took. Do you want to do some more like that?
Okay. I'm trying to remember now what what the what the questions were. They were just about um, yeah, turn a function in uh, the power series. It was sort of uh, in the general category of simple tricks about power series. I don't know if this is what it was, but something like that maybe we could try. Find the power series and the radius of convergence. Rad of comms. Um, so this one you want to use the one that everybody knows about, which is this. Oh, I forgot under under my list of formulas that I will give you, I forgot I was going to give you a bunch of Taylor series. Maybe everybody could just write these in right now. This, Sorry about that. I, I omitted them from the uh, list of formulas that I will give you. But I am, I am definitely going to give you this. So this is one. This is the geometric series. And this one has the radius of convergence is one. So I'm also going to tell you that. Then we have e to the x, sine x, and cosine x. Those are the ones I'm going to tell you. So e to the x is this. Same thing, but with uh, one over factorials. This one, uh, all three of these have infinite radius of convergence. That is, they always converge. The sine is the one which has only the, e, uh, only the odd powers of x and alternating plus minuses. And the cosine has the even powers. like that. So all of these I will tell you on the test. Sorry, I forgot those on the paper. Anyway, the problem which you see at the top there is find the power series for this. And um, you should look in the box there and say this one looks like one of those with some simple modifications. And it looks like the first one. It, it should be obvious which one it looks like. It certainly doesn't look like any of the other ones. So it looks like the first one. Um, what are the simple modifications? First of all, instead of a 1 on top, we have a 2. That's easily handled by just factoring the 2 out. You want to you wanna sort of simplify or rewrite that thing to make it look like what I wrote inside the box. Actually, and let's just to make it more interesting, can I put a plus here instead of a minus? 1 plus 2x squared. This will make it even more fun. All right, we need to rewrite that to make it look more like the one in the box. The, the first and easiest thing to do, I'm just going to write this again, is just bring the factor that 2 from the numerator all the way out to the front. So now the numerator looks like a 1. I want it to look like 1 over 1 minus something. It says 1 plus something, so I change that around to like a, a double negative sort of a thing like this. Now it does look like 1 over 1 minus something. And so I'm going to plug in negative 2x squared to this formula. All right, that's my strategy. I use the series in the box for 1 over 1 minus x squared. But instead of x, I use um, negative 2x squared. And so it looks like. 1 plus negative 2x squared plus negative 2x squared squared plus negative 2x squared cubed, like that, right? The formula in the box just says um, increasing powers of x. And so I'm doing increasing powers of that thing, negative 2x squared. All right. Now, on the quiz, I believe I said... First of all, write it as a summation, and then write out the first uh, four terms. So as a, um, as a summation, I would write it like this. It's just powers of that, n equals 0 to infinity. All right? And I think most people did this properly. 
writing it as a summation. I will be clear on the test exactly how, what I want you to write. Um, and we can simplify this a little bit, or I don't know if this is simpler, but sometimes I like to see just powers of x with certain coefficients. This is very clearly written as some coefficient in front of a power of x. All right. So if I say write it as a summation, this is what I want to see. Uh, on the quiz, I also said write out the first four terms. I got several people didn't know what I meant by that, I guess. What I mean is write out, this is a big sum of infinitely many things. I just wanted you to write the first four things that you get out of that sum. It involves plugging in n equals the first four values of n, which in this case are 0, 1, 2, 3. Um, several people actually went over here and just plugged in values for x. They plugged in like x equals 1 and then x equals 2. That, that is not what I meant. And I mean, you get some numbers, but th those are not the terms of the power series. Those are just some numbers. Anyway, um, if I write out the first four terms, what that means is just write this, the actual things that you get from this sum when you, when you start it off. Using, first of all, using n equals 0. It just gives me 1 because it's things to the 0 power. So it begins with a 1. Next, using n equals 1, I get negative 2 to the power of 1 times x, right? Next, using n equals 2, the minus 2 gets squared, I get a 4. 4x squared. Using n equals 3, it's going to be minus 8x cubed. All right. Uh, this is the n equals 1 term, right? This is... Yeah? Oh, yeah, yeah, thank you. I left out the, the squared, and so that's actually going to change what I wrote at the, beginning, at the end. Negative 2, this uh, x squared in there, so this is actually going to be x to the 2n, right? Or x squared to the n. It's x to the 2n. So, the powers of x, which I wrote down here, actually they should all get, they should all be doubled. So this first one is x to the 2, the next is x to the 4, and then x to the 6. Sorry about that. Thank you for the correction. Like so. Now I'm satisfied. All right, and I also said on the quiz, find me the radius of convergence. So you have to know that I used this series up here. I used this series, and that series has radius of convergence equal to 1. All right, so it converges whenever the thing inside the parentheses is less than 1. So I'm going to say it converges when absolute value 2x squared minus 2x squared is less than 1. And what does that mean about x? Well, when I take those absolute values, this is the same as this. They just squeeze all the way down around the x. Divide the 2, take the square root. Absolute value x less than 1 over square root of 2. And this is the radius of convergence. ROC, 1 over root 2. All right. The one on the quiz was similar to that. second one. I don't remember what the... Oh, the first one on the quiz was about using the ratio test to find the radius of convergence. People did better on that one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah, I mean, this was on the homework. Yeah, I hadn't, uh, I hadn't graded it at that point. It's true. What else? We got another 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. 
Sure, yeah. The root test is a little obscure. Uh, it's not really hard to do, uh, in my opinion. Um, it may be, you know, you might... I think your obstacle with the root test maybe is just you might not think of doing it, but um, the root test is most useful. Well, let me just... I will refresh our memory about what it is first. The root test is for a series like... Um, well, if it's just the sum of a n, whatever a n is. Uh, this is this is not about power series, it's just about a series. And can you tell me if it converges or not? And the root test says for this thing, you consider, it's like this L thing, so it's similar in practice, similar to the ratio test, although you don't do a ratio, you do this. You take the nth root of a n, and sorry, there should be a limit in there. You do lim, n goes to infinity, nth root of a n. And the, um, this tells you if it converges or not, and the, the, the conclusion is the same as in the root test. If the L is less than 1, then the uh, series converges. If the L is greater than 1, it diverges. And if L equals 1, then it's inconclusive and you have to do it some other way. All right, this is the root test. Uh, let's just try one. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll look in the, in the book for an example. I gave you one on the paper there to try. So when you look at the ones on the paper from that section... The ratio test and the root test. Just looking down the list there, these are on the paper numbers 47, 48, and 49. Um, actually, the first two of those, you should use the ratio test. And the third one, number 49, you should use the root test. And the reason is because the root test is most often used. I'm just going to say use it when you see... Um, Something like n to the power n, this is a giveaway that the root test is going to be useful. n to the power n is very difficult to handle because you have n inside the exponent and also n in, in the bottom. Um, so I will say use it when you see n to the power n is this sort of the simplest thing um, or something like, you know, 1 plus n squared to the power n, etc., what you're looking for is the n inside the exponent and the base, that is the, the, the thing downstairs, right? If you see n's in both of those, you should probably use the root test because there aren't good ways to handle that. Um, if n is in the one but not the other, then it's not so bad. But if it's in both, then you've got to use the root test. Uh, okay, I'm looking for an example here. The root test. Okay, how about I see number 27 in section 11.6? We'll try it. Negative 1 to the n minus 1 over the natural log of n to the n. So when I see that thing on the bottom, natural log of n to the power n, I immediately think of the root test because I have an exponent thing where the n is part of the exponent, but it's also part of the thing of the base, the thing uh, inside those parentheses there. And so I'm going to do the root test. It is. Uh, I'm sorry. I... When I wrote this, there should be absolute values in here. Can I fit those in there? In the root test, when you when you do the uh, the roots, I left out the absolute value. You have to do this because if the if the thing inside is negative, then that that uh, root won't even exist uh, for even values. Then so, uh, all right. 
it's just jogged my memory when I saw the minus one um, inside there. So the root test, in this case, I am looking at the limb, n goes to infinity, the nth root of absolute value of this thing. All right. <clears throat> First of all, the effect of the absolute value is just to cancel out the numerator there. The numerator becomes irrelevant when you take the absolute value. The denominator is the natural log of n, which provided that n is greater than 1, which it is, the natural log of n is, is going to be positive, so the absolute values won't affect the uh, denominator at all. So this, as far as the absolute values, they can just go away entirely um, and cancel the uh, numerator out entirely. So it's like this, right? And when I do the nth root, of course, the, any root of a fraction is always like you do the root on the top and also on the bottom. So on the top, it's the nth root of 1, which is, again, 1. And on the bottom, so this I can write as instead like this, right? Doing the square root or the nth root of 1 is 1. And what about the bottom? How can we simplify nth root of log n to the n? Yeah, the nth root will cancel the exponent of the n. And this is the whole point of the root test, is that it's a cute way of canceling out an exponent of, of n. So this, the same as lim n goes to infinity, 1 over natural log of n. And what happens in here when the n goes to infinity? When the n goes to infinity, the denominator there becomes infinite because the natural log continues to get bigger and bigger. Yeah, so this limit equals 0. And thus, the series converges, right? The uh, ratio, uh, the root test said if the, what you're looking for is if this thing is less than 1, then it converges. And it was 0, so the series converges. All right. What else? Since we're talking about homeworks being graded before the test, uh, your last homework assignment being due on the day of the test will not be graded by the time you take the test. Uh, if you if you want to show it to me, you know, if you if you do it ahead of time, I would be happy to uh, take a look and tell you how you did. Yeah, I can do that. Uh, yeah, for those of you who uh, who do it before the test, I will I'll go through them um, and grade them all. Sure. Partial fractions. I kind of like the partial fractions. I don't know if anyone else likes the partial fractions. It's different, yeah. I once had people over for dinner, and I made dinner. I thought it was good. My guest said, oh, it's different. Yeah, I didn't like that. 
It was a partial fractions related dinner. Yeah. Um, it's a it's an acquired taste maybe. Um, some of them you got to divide first. You want to try one like that? Actually, I'm going to look in the book again because the partial fractions are truly um, very messy if you try to make it up at random because it involves solving the system, which is impossible to plan ahead with. So let's try. I'm just going to pull one out of the book. Let's try this. This is 7.4, number 9. This one you don't have to divide first. And they are... They factored it for us already. I don't know if this was on our homework or not. All right. Do the partial fractions. Now, on the test, I might not tell you to do the partial fractions. It, it will be up to you to decide what you have to do in order to make the integrals work out. But I think the partial fraction is pretty easy to identify. It's when you see polynomials in the top and also in the bottom, usually that's when you should be using partial fractions. And the bottom is already factored for us, which is, which is considerate. So we have to do this thing. This is the purpose of the partial fractions, is to take something like that and split it up into two fractions. <clears throat> All right. And we do this by making a common denominator on the left side. The common denominator, it is the, the denominator that you see above or, or to the right. So the, the common denominator is obtained by multiplying these guys, right? And in the numerator, it has to say A gets multiplied by this one, right? And then B gets multiplied by that other one. So it's going to look like A times X minus 1 plus B times 2X plus 1. And this is supposed to equal 5X plus 1 in the numerator with the same denominator. Now, the denominators don't matter at this point. We just set the two numerators equal to each other because the two denominators are the same. So it says a, I'm going to distribute ax minus a plus 2bx plus b equals 5x plus 1. And then we gather together the x terms and also the constants. So putting together the x's, I get um, a plus 2b x and then plus negative a plus b as the constant. And this equals 5x plus 1. And that gives us a system of two variables and two equations. You, you set equal the coefficients on x on both sides. That gives me a plus 2b equals 5. And we set equal the constants on both sides. Negative a plus b equals 1. And I can tell already this is going to have a good, uh, good solutions here. Solve the system. You can do this however you like. This one happens to be convenient to add the two equations together. The a's will cancel, and then you'll, otherwise you will get 3b equals 6, which means b is 2. And then if I put that in the first equation, it'll say a plus 4 equals 5, so a must be 1. Anybody? Sorry, I'm off the bottom. Everybody agree? I hope so. Okay, so that means my original thing was 5x plus 1 over this stuff, 2x plus 1, x minus 1, dx. And this is equal to, the a was 1, so it's 1 over 2x plus 1 plus 2 over x minus 1. All right. Here's a little pro tip if you're ever writing an exam. When I, when, I, when I create my partial fractions questions, I start here and then multiply it out to see what you get. And then I give you that to start with and make you reverse it. Um, you probably don't care about that. Anyway, now we do the integral here. So we're going to do the integral of those. Um, each time we get just the natural log of something or other. Now, the first one actually... Uh, 
is uh, is slightly complicated because there's a coefficient of two in front of the x. Really, what we do, I'm gonna let's handle them separately, like this, right? You could pull a one half out of it. Yeah, actually, I hadn't I hadn't considered. Uh, so the fact is, the integral of 1 over x plus a constant is the natural log of any x plus whatever that, that constant was. That's what we're going to do up here. When there's an extra constant in front of the x, you have to either do a u substitution, um, and then the du will have like a one-half in it, and so we get, anyway, we're going to get this. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to do it like, like he said. If you pull out the one half, then what remains is going to be x plus a half in the denominator. Yeah. Another way to think this through is by doing a u substitution. Anyway, the other one, plus 2 ln f to the value x minus 1. Plus c, of course. Yeah, this one's kind of interesting because if you instead did the u substitution, you would you would end up with this. If you do the u substitution, you get that. If you do by pulling the one half out, you get what I wrote above. And they look different. They don't look. And in fact, they are different. But actually, those two things they are different by a constant, and so they are both the antiderivative, even though they don't. They don't look the same as a, as a function because they are different by a constant. Not really important. Partial fractions. It works. I think maybe I like partial fractions because it's useful in other contexts too. It's not just a trick for doing integrals, but it's a trick that you can use for other things. like. Last week we did a partial fractions to find the series for something, uh, and you can use it's used in. Um, there are tricks from differential equations which involve the partial fractions, so it's a it's a general purpose trick for doing lots of lots of different things. Are we run out of steam here? We don't have to stay the whole time if uh, if folks are. Um, exhausted with the questions. Uh, I would be happy to answer any more questions by email. Um, I don't have like scheduled office hours this week, but um, if you do have questions and you want to get together and, and, and chat on the Zoom, I would be happy to do that. Just let me know um, when you want to do it, and we'll try and set something up. So my, yeah, my line on that is the new stuff is at least one third of the exam. So I wouldn't say very heavy, but yeah, it'll be there. I'm going to.